us essentially a little over a year to put together the heavy lifting, to put together all of those program pieces um, that we need to put into place. Um, um, and I, the slide was called Road Work Ahead. Um, they had those six pieces. When you, and I, it was a part of this, as you can copy. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, so it's the, developing the program guidelines, the operating manual, the framework design, the metrics, the professional development plan, and the instructional support. Um, it would also allow us time to develop a screening tool for kinder recruitment, which really aligns with shifting dual language and Spanish immersion to an advanced academics um, offering, um, course offering. Um, the, also, the other piece of this is if we were to add, in addition to shifting our recruiting back to kinder, shifting both program models to a 50-50 program model would actually ease the requirements to have bilingual certified teachers we could suffice with one bilingual certified teacher and an ESL teacher. So that would ease some of those certification requirements that are so difficult to fill, that again are not a Lavernia issue, that's a Texas issue. Um, and it would also allow us to repurpose two different positions. One of them, we could take um, one of our pre-K staff member, who's excellent, we could repurpose her to be a student interventionist and that is a staff member that we have on all of our campuses to support our students who are struggling um, with you know, language acquisition or academics in general. That would also allow us to um, repurpose the position right now who is the interventionist and shift her over into a full-time coach. That is paramount to supporting this program is to have a support for teachers. Um, every other program in our school district has some sort of a coach that our teachers can access. So I believe that's imperative um, that we have that support for our teachers to help with the lesson planning and the lesson execution and all those pieces. Um, this staffing design by having one bilingual and one ESL teacher, K through four, um, again, it, it helps us with the recruiting. We would only have needed half of the teachers that we need now that, that have the full bilingual certification. Um, and also, by having dual language and Spanish immersion at each grade level, that would allow at least two teachers at each grade level, which would optimize collaboration efforts. So this, um, I know this, you're thinking, well, this sounds like we would keep Spanish immersion. Well, this slide that says possibility is the only way in which we can really keep Spanish immersion. And it seems as if our community um, highly values this program model for dual language and, and Spanish immersion so that our students can become both bilingual and biliterate. Um, and so if we were to entertain thoughts of keeping it, that this is really the only way um, that we can see that we could, we could be able to do that and do it well. Um, I think I emphasized at our board meeting last week that if, if we continue to have these programs, I just want to be sure we can do them well um, and serve our students to the best of our abilities. So Kelly, and I have to thank both Donna and Kelly that have done a fantastic job outlining um, the financials um, that shows, um, it actually demonstrates three different scenarios. And so I'm gonna allow her to talk um, everyone through the financials. So there are six pages. Um, there's a lot of information here, and this was created by an English um, degree person. So my degree is in liberal arts, and I realize that this is fallible. But um, with the help of Donna Schwerz, um, I have created sort of what ifs. And so the first, the top sheet that has the blue ideas at the top, that is looking at what if we continued everything as is. Our current model, our current programs, what are the financials that we know and that we can project based on what we know if we continued everything as is. And so the first column that says 2018-19 instructional materials, that is gathering the data that um, was available to us based on purchases, 
for instructional materials that are specific to Spanish instruction, which would be specific to bilingual, uh, bilingual program. And that is here, dual language and Spanish immersion. So both programs. The ones that are in gray are grayed out because those are large purchases that were um, done to begin those products in our usage. Those are not something that we would have to purchase annually to that degree. So those are kind of isolated in that way. And so that 2018-19 estimate shows you approximately what we've spent just for that program. Um, dual language and Spanish humor. Yeah, and instructional mm -hmm. materials and supplies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Not staff. Not staff. Yeah, that's, that's the next column. So the next column, they're, they're kind of separated by those long gray bars. So the second set of data that says staffing underneath 1920. So this is a projection based upon what we, um, the program we have now, and what would be required to continue as is for 1920. And this is based on an average salary of a teacher, which would be approximately $50,000. Um, our stipend is known, it is $3,000. And those only attach to the, to the bilingual educator. So that BE means bilingual educator, and that is the certification of bilingual education. Um, so you see at, in the blue where it says average salary, the total estimate is there. Um, the stipends are off to the right, so that's the total number of stipends if we continue as is for 1920. And then the aggregate is the 696. And that number is total salaries just for the program if we continue as is for next year. So underneath the aggreg aggregate, there are a few more rows. And what I've done there is um, in anticipation of the discussion and the questions about pre-K tuition. I've isolated how much are just the salaries for our pre-K team. And so our pre-K team, if we continue as is, includes two bilingual teachers, two uh, pre-K aides, and that amount is the $146,000. And then the 108 is projected tuition offset. So what I've done, even though it's a 1920 projection, I'm using the 1819 tuition that we have coming in now, because that's all we know. And so um, the 108 is how much is incoming now for tuition, and then the red is the 38,000. That's how much our shortfall is for pre-K being self-funding. And then the 588,500 um, number, that is the total program staffing costs. Um, keep in mind that some of these students and some of these teachers would be here anyway. And so it's not an isolated program cost. But it is absorbing what we have. It, it's counting for what we have now and if we move it forward, that's how much it would cost to staff. Talk a little about... Wait, so what did you mean to be here anyway? So there, there were some comments from the parents and in the focus groups and in all of our talks about, well, the students, we need to teach the students regardless. So if the kids were enrolled in Laverne ISD, whether in dual language or Spanish immersion or gen ed, they're going to need a teacher. And so that average salary of 50000 might already be there. Outside of pre-K. The pre-K wouldn't be here. All Correct. Right? The pre-K wouldn't be but here. But kindergarten or first grade or second grade, they would have to go to the class. Mm -hmm. Some of those pre-K pre students there. may be eligible to attend pre-K. Right. Mm -hmm. So in all fairness, some of the pre-K students might be eligible to attend in a general pre-K classroom eligible to attend um, based on their socioeconomic status or military family status and those sorts of things. So we would have and all of the ELs. So the ELs that are now enrolled in dual that get full day pre-K, mm -hmm. they would, if their parents choose to enroll them in pre-K, they would qual qualify for the half day pre-K that we offer already. Right. At our last meeting, we commented that some of the class sizes were like 10 students. Yes. Though, right? We so do this have smaller class sizes. So it's not a one for one. Correct. Right. Close to one. Correct. Yeah. It's not a one for one. So I don't know, not knowing the total campus numbers and how those are divided up, it's it's hard for me to project how many teachers exactly would we be having if we just went to Gen Ed because I don't know how all those kids would be divvied up. So this is a this is a program number, but it's not um, in real comparison to Gen Ed. And then the next um, section, the pre-K tuition revenue. This is only for our non-ELs, because ELs qualify for the um, tuition-free pre-K, so they would not be paying. So the current enrollment of non-ELs, 
Um, the pre-K dual language number is 14, and the pre-K Spanish immersion number is 18. Those are all of our students who are not classified as English learners, currently enrolled in pre-K. The next number in the blue, the actual revenue, are the numbers of students that are paying full price tuition. What is the tuition amount? So the tuition amount is $4,500 a year. It's $500 a month over nine months. And so if you multiply the full-time payers in each class, um, we have the 108,000 number is our actual income and tuition. It takes at least 16 <coughs> full-paying students to counteract um, or offset the cost of the salaries but that is an estimate of salaries, average salaries, and it does not include fringe benefits. So it might actually be more than 16 if you count the fringe benefits. So the yellow um, next to that, it says the maximum allowed. So this is the what if all seats were filled and all students, all the non-ELs non paid full tuition. So we would have 33 students. That's the maximum currently if we kept everything as is. And the, the income from that would be 148500 So that's the as-is model. Underneath are just some pros and cons that were jotted down. These are obviously not an all-inclusive list. There are more, I'm sure, that could be brought to the table on both sides. <coughs> the next sheet that's in the red is what we're calling phase out. This is the one that came out of the focus group <coughs> on February the 7th, um, that the district committed to continuing the commitment of Spanish immersion to the three cohorts that are there now, that are currently in pre-K, kinder, and first, and seeing those three cohorts of students all the way through fifth grade. So this is working out that model. The 2018 instructional materials, I just kept that because that's what we have. The 1920 staffing model, you can see that the pre-K bilingual teacher for Spanish immersion is blanked out. Also, the pre-K aid is blanked out. Mm -hmm. You can see the total estimate for um, salaries with stipends, and then the total aggregate of 623500 The pre-K salaries goes down to 73000 because we've reduced by a teacher and an aid. Then we have the 36000 um, that is the projected pre-K tuition based upon the same numbers we have currently, but taking away the Spanish immersion class. And so we would have um, a total program staffing cost under this model for next year alone of 587,500. And then the last um, sheet that has the green. So, so Kelly, is that, that is for one year. For one year, for so next then year. we would carry that forward as well. So yes, then sir. year two, all the way until. Right, but for five years. So I have in the back, I have some more sheets that we can look at to carry forward. So the, the green sheet that's next, we're calling Kinder Recruiting, and this is the 50 50 model consideration. And so we had to take into consideration the 50 50 model because it affects staffing. So that you can see the instructional materials are the same. The staffing um, has blanked out pre-K, the whole team of pre-K. And then calculating, again, average salaries without benefits for all the teachers and the stipends, um, you see an estimate of 550000 plus stipends is 568000 There's no pre-K offset. Ms. Table, what about the, the bill uh, interventionist? So the bilingual interventionist is paid for out of Title I, which is federal funds. It's a, it's a budget neutral, okay. and so she's still there. I put the number there on one of the charts, and then I put Title I on the other. So this one has the actual amount, but it's not calculated in. If you'll notice, um, this 568000 amount also includes underneath the bilingual interventionist, the proposal of a bilingual instructional coach is calculated into that. Um, then we have the pros and the cons of that one, the same thing. So then the next three sheets are, they're color-coded the same for reference. The first one is the as-is model, and what I did was I projected if we continue as-is for more than one year, what are we looking at? How do our costs grow or decrease? 
And I only went so far until I got um, sort of a stasis in how much it costs. So for the first year, 1819 is, is here now. This is what we have now. But then the first year would be 1920, and that's the 588,500 number that you saw on the first sheet. And then it goes up to 691,500 in the year 2020, 2021. And it stays at that number in 21, 22. Because that's, we would have all pre-K through fifth grade full. Correct. The next sheet looks a lot smaller. Um, this is not my version of the joke on your eyesight. It's just because I had to go out more years. Because if we phase the program out, it changes every year for the next five years. And so the amount goes from the 583000 up to 633000 back down to 586000 So between the year um, school year 21 and school year in 22, we would actually decrease one bil bilingual educator. And then in the following school year in 23, we go to 533,000, mm -hmm. and then we stay at that number. <coughs> I know it's a lot to look at. And then the last page, the, the green one again with the 50-50 model, we go from 568,000 next year to a number of 671,000. And that's the number that would remain if we carry through with the kinder recruitment 50-50 model. And I think you have one page that might be helpful um, as you look through that. My husband has notes written all over it. So the summary page, it has basically those three models that we just looked at, but it has the totals for, again, just program salaries from the year 2019-2020 all the way through the year 2023 to 2024. That's a lot of 20s. And so the color coding is basically the stoplight system. The green one is the least expensive, the red one is the most expensive, and the yellow one is in the middle. So for the year 2019-2020, the least expensive model is the kinder recruitment model, which is the proposal on the table. And then it shifts to being the intermediate model as we carry that through. Is it state law that uh, pre-K has to have aids just based on the number of kids being watched in the classroom? Yes. Okay. Pre-K, all pre-K has to be. It's a requirement that we have eight assistants in there. So all of these programs are adding the interventionist the interventionist is already there. We already have an interventionist. She's paid completely out of Title I funds. So every proposal has that position carrying over. The only difference is in the kinder recruitment, we are adding the bilingual instructional coach versus splitting the interventionist position into half and adding half-time coach. And the challenge with the full-time interventionist reducing to a half-time interventionist as we get more and more kids in the intermediate grades, we're a testing testing grade. Yeah, mm -hmm. the testing, the assessment, we're going to need the interventionist. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Okay. So it's a bigger challenge for the interventionist to be able to schedule and sit with kids throughout the day and yet still coach teachers. You mentioned that an interventionist was paid differently when I on the time you paid up the position. So why so why are we saying half? If it doesn't cost us anything, why don't why are we saying a whole interventionist from the very beginning of the model? It's not going to cost us anything. Mm -hmm. Well, we're trying to figure out a way to do more with less, and we know that our teachers need an instructional coach. And so we're trying to provide that in the most efficient way possible. And so we thought by splitting that position, we could have one person who serves two roles. And we would also have to split fund per salary. Mm -hmm. You or can divide up a time to some of that. So with I was just saying, why don't we get a whole interventionist and have coach? Because then you have to pay for half somewhere else in the district. Well, this, yeah. 
Kinder recruitment model allows us in its existing staff, um, and it allows us to reposition so we can have a full interventionist and a whole coach. If you added a half coach, you would have to figure out what that person does the other half of the day. So, so the the coach also has to be certified. Yes. In, in regards to probably. Yes. A coach has to have street cred. Okay. And if you're not certified, then it's hard to go in and coach teachers on how to how to refine their craft. And it's probably in here. But how many students are COVID talking about? Is that Just which one? For the whole program. So the DRS, uh, is it the 8762 number? Okay, so on, I'll just work with this first page, the blue one. Okay. On the far right, yep. um, those are the numbers of parent removals. So the 87 is the current enrollment for dual, and the 62 is the current enrollment for SI. Um, the next column is the number of parent removals this school year and the program that those students were associated with. Okay, so the current enrolled is the right, that's how many students were yes. serving. And we sort of expect that to continue to be the number of <coughs> when we have a class. Right. <laughs> and so that's one of the advantages that's listed on here. Um, to both the kinder recruitment and the as-is model is when <coughs> the community realizes that the program is going to continue, then it encourages them to sustain their commitment to be participating in the program. Because without participation, we don't have a program. With the as, um, I'm sorry, with the phase-out model, that, that sentiment is at risk.
you don't do it with fidelity, then no, it's not going to be a good idea. But um, it's my opinion that the dual language program, the Spanish enrichment program, Spanish immersion program, are best practice. And that has to do more with the science of the brain than it has to do with learning a different language. If you have the infrastructure, which we don't have yet, so we'll have to work on that. So, in my experience, many schools offer more than one strand of dual, but there are very few schools, and I even contacted the Bridge Service Center to see how many, can I get a list of schools that do dual and Spanish very few that do that both of those models. They didn't have an answer for me. I called, I got back with them, and they said they're still looking. So there's not a list all across the state that you can pull. You just have to do some calling around. It's a very new area. Now, with dual language schools, you can pull up a list of who has dual language schools. But to answer your question, to have more than one strand, to overextend yourself in any program is not a good idea. And I think that that's the feeling we had, and that was the re one of the reasons the program evaluation because we know we've got to be doing some things inefficiently or some things we can do better. Um, but not there yet. As long as our teachers are ESL certified, they're allowed to teach dual language and Spanish work. They get the funds for dual language if they have a half day ESL. So the funds come based upon the English learners in the program. Those are the only kids that get additional funding. The requirement, the statutory requirement for certification in a dual language program is when it's teamed, when you have one teacher giving English instruction and one teacher giving Spanish instruction. The English teacher who's teaching in English can be ESL certified and can be compliant. The one who gives Spanish instruction has to be um, the bilingual certification. And that just changed a few years ago. Before that, you had to have purely bilingual.
Ms. Tabor is recommending to go to the split, the 50 50 split between ESL and, and BE. And I was wondering if we currently had certified teachers to move to a split model. If we just, don't recruit pre K. Just, just yes, I'm looking up in Kinder. 